To get started today, we've got uh, Bill Rowe and Mark Thomas. They're going to talk about security response at the ASF and lead off the security track. Um, so let's uh, like to introduce ourselves and actually would also like if you could briefly introduce yourself. I'd like to find out um, uh, who, who our attendees are here um, so we know which audience we're, we're presenting to. Um, but just to start out, I um, wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about how we each came to the security team uh, and what it is that uh, we do for the ASF. Um, so uh, I'm Bill Rowe, uh, this is Mark Thomas, um, and my involvement in Apache goes back to about 2000. Um, what happened uh, in my case is I started to use the uh, Apache uh, web server um, on Windows. Um, the Apache web server on, on the Windows platform. Uh, and almost the very first time that I wrote a CGI example, I then discovered a quote unquote vulnerability. Um, it seemed like something that could be uh, readily abused or misused by anyone who was uh, using a shared hosting provider. And so I uh, scrambled around having never used Apache style open source before trying to figure out where exactly I ought to, who exactly I ought to point this out to so it gets fixed before more people discover the same problem. And that's how I even got involved with the Apache project, uh, the web server project, as well as uh, the security team. Uh, I'm a committer on the Apache Tomcat project. So I got involved in the security side of things when I had a deal with my first security vulnerability report for Tomcat. Um, didn't make too much of a mess of it. So after doing a, handling a couple of those, the security team said, oh, you seem to know what you're doing, so why won't you come and join the security team? Sure, why not? Um, so I've been on the security team for uh, five, six years now. Um, but my primary focus at Apache is, as I say, as a committer on Tomcat. I also do other bits and pieces. Um, I'm part of the infrastructure team um, and help out in other projects, Commons being the, the most obvious. And so we have uh, basically with throughout the ASF, uh, the first thing that's probably worth pointing out is there are only about eight primary members of the Apache security response team. And we've got a little bit of exposure to everything. Um, the chairman, um, Mark Cox, uh, is a very long, very, very well uh, respected um, uh, writer about topics and, and has been maintained the Apache Week Journal for, for a number of years. Uh, and he's active at Red, at Red Hat um, and does a lot of their corporate bug triage as well as the uh, Apache, open, uh, Apache open source. Um, so he's our, he's our chairman. Um, we have other expertise such as uh, Ben Laurie, uh, who's a very well respected um, OpenSSL committer uh, and who's extremely familiar with um, you know, the, the intricacies of TLS and SSL. And so through some of these mechanisms, we actually get a sniff of what could be happening in other related projects that are outside of the Apache Foundation and uh, hopefully can bring that information to specific projects. One thing the security team does not do uh, is actually fix security bugs. Uh, the security team's primary goal, uh, we're literally switchboard operators or traffic cops or what have you to make sure that the different projects within the ASF, um, uh, in fact, communicate uh, amongst themselves, uh, come up with a, a reasonable approach, given how severe a report is, um, that best protects the users. Um, so uh, we've, we effectively want to make sure that nobody is shocked, surprised, um, that uh, uh, this information leaks out before there's a remedy. Uh, so let me see here. Um, just to give you a, something kind of fun, this is this is actually the the inception of the security team before it was an actual committee. Um, we had this absolutely absurd uh, URL or email address, um, thinking that it would prevent people from uh, spamming the list. Uh, that didn't work out too well. But I found a I found a uh, I can't remember, I can't read it from my angle. Um, but along the lines of, I found a hole in the Apache uh, web server at apache.org. Uh, and this alias actually still does work today. Um, we were just commenting that it might be time to turn it off. Uh, because the canonical address 
for anything security at the foundation is, a, is security at apache.org. Um, and all of the projects are welcome to advertise that address um, and then it becomes our issue to communicate with the with the individual projects um, and hopefully identify uh, some projects have their own security lists other projects don't ever expect to have a vulnerability and even after they've discovered one that's exploitable don't ever expect to have another one so they're not an ideal candidate for having this whole infrastructure of a security specific list and the only reason that we don't simply use all our private lists is that we want to keep the awareness of these things limited to the people who will actually help address them. Um, we could spam the entire, uh, I believe, Apache web server is, a th is 100 participants um, uh, on that project management committee, emeritus and current, and we could spam all 100 of them. Um, but in actuality, there are about 15, 20 of us who are active in, in solving those bugs, and I, that's your experience as well. You have about five at Tomcat? Yeah, there's, there's um, yeah, so it's about that. It depends on um, what the particular issue is, which particular members of the, the project are going to be interested in. There's normally about five, five or so people contributing. So, uh, so Ken Kaur, uh, one of the original security team founders, is the one who set up these mailing lists and uh, was the first to begin triaging all of the reports and within a matter of a month uh, we were getting about a hundred um, five spam a day uh, to this garbage collection ba uh, basket um, and three or four times a year um, an incident of note uh, that did turn out to merit more investigation and, and actually become a become a security concern um, there were actually two things that uh, launched this whole effort we had, we had seen even from the day that the first eight founders started hacking on the Apache web server together, there were already known security weaknesses in, in the software. So um, that, that was always an incentive for having a private communications channel. Uh, and then we had a rather ugly incident, um, I believe very early 2001, um, and it actually had nothing to do with Apache software, it was the SSH software um, that had a vulnerability and at that point, we had to consider our entire versioning at the time was CVS. We had to consider our CVS repository suspect. Um, and there was a mad scramble, and of course, a mad scramble to publicize this to the world that um, here is what happened and here is how we're reacting to it. Um, and that, in large part, is actually not on our security team list anymore. It's actually, we have an entirely dedicated infrastructure team uh, four paid employees at the foundation, and they maintain an infrastructure blog. And to this day, uh, about a couple months ago, they were writing new blog articles about the latest security concern that had affected, uh, uh, I believe it was the bug, one of the bug trackers. Um, oh, that Jira had issues a few years ago. Um, the most recent sort of Apache wide infrastructure problem we had was. Uh, we discovered that um, we'd enabled some forensic logging on the web servers, or we, or rather we knew we'd enabled the forensic logging. What we'd forgotten was that that was gonna log all of the headers, which included the basic authorization headers, which meant we were logging everybody's SVN password, which is the same as their shell password for Mino and possibly other boxes as well. Um, and those passwords were readable to any committer. So effectively, any committer could read any other committer's password. Hence, we moved rather quickly to uh, remove those logs and make everybody change their passwords. Um, so that, that's, that sort of thing now is the responsibility of the infrastructure team. And yeah, that one was, was definitely on us. Uh, the one before that was, a, was an issue with Jira. Uh, and that, that was cross-site scripting problems in Jira, which was the root cause of the problem, followed by... Um, sort of a cascade of smaller issues that all, all ended up with um, the attackers having root on the box that was running all of our issue trackers. Fortunately, that wasn't, um, that was as far as they got. We caught it fairly quickly. But the, the full gory details of, of how that happened is all on the, the um, infrastructure blog. And fundamentally, 
that's sort of the way we try and we try and approach all of this security stuff is that we keep it private um, until the incident's dealt with and then we, we publish as much information as we can um, the idea being that you know we've messed up so you know take the opportunity to learn from our mistakes uh, and that goes for the infrastructure team as well as it does for for any of the projects um, and in fact, that's a, that, that brings up an interesting uh, a topic, which is just uh, what do we hear about and how do we hear about it? Um, anybody here who does is involved in security uh, is probably familiar with the long, uh, long stale debate about uh, full disclosure versus um, responsible disclosure. Uh, but the argue, so there are various arguments, and the Apache Foundation has always had the opinion that the world, the entire world should be able to have the information and react to it as they individually need to at the same time. Uh, so we have a long tradition of not having a, uh, what you might call a vendor list or something or a priority subscription to uh, security uh, informa information about vulnerabilities. Um, so the, the core team, effectively all you need to do um, to be in the know and, and you know that get the back uh, the inside scoop is to participate on your project's uh, management committee um, and at that point you are privy to whatever is being privately discussed uh, but that's of course dependent on uh, a reporter who believes in responsible disclosure and I would say that um, nine-tenths of all <coughs> Apache related issues are found by such people uh, and about half of them are security researchers. I think that's a reasonable approximation. Yeah, I'd have to have to go and look at the stats, and it's probably the case of the sort of the uh, the ten percent of issues that aren't disclosed responsibly, uh, sort of disclosed um, accidentally rather than deliberately. Um, somebody, and what often happens is somebody will find a security vulnerability in a product, and then rather than thinking, ah probably want to keep this private they go and enter it on the project's bug tracker which of course is public which sends all of its updates to the mailing lists so at that point you've, you're effectively dealing with with a full disclosure um, and how much of a problem that is really depends on what the vulnerability is um, some are obviously worse than others but I, I don't think we've certainly within Tomcat I don't think we've ever had somebody um, just publish an issue without giving us any warning or an opportunity to respond in advance. Uh, the, you know, certainly, I think, yeah, I don't think we've ever had anything. So they've all been either res <coughs> disclosed responsibly or they've sort of been the accidental, oh, I didn't think, I didn't mean to make it public, sorry, is that a problem? Now, and now of course, the experience of the HTTPD project is significantly different. Um, there has always been, because it's so widely adopted because it's installed on so many machines just out of the box, uh, it's always been a prime target um, for Trojans, for other root kits. Um, and there, much of the investment in, you know, of the core developers in Apache has just been working around um, that set of issues. Um, but I, on, on, so on the Apache side, a web server, um, we do have periodically about once every four or five years, uh, a zero day disclosure of here is what we found, and, and it's largely, um, in the case of Apache Web Server, it's uh, for the researchers, um, for the hacking community, it's, it's largely a challenge, it's a puzzle, um, and the, there is a group of that, a subset of those researchers uh, who are very, very strongly uh, full disclosure. And the only thing a PMC can do in that case, it's, it's no longer really the security team, we, we have very little to offer because everything at that point might as well be discussed on your dev list. Uh, putting the most, more heads on the problem, getting, you know, even, even from the general public and getting a solution out there. Um, I wanna say that there hasn't been a, a day that ever passed with a zero day that we did not have multiple competing patches that would in fact work around the problem um, that were brought to the dev list and um, it would generally take half a day or a day and a half to have an organized response uh, and pick the best of breed of what are several patches or workarounds. Yeah, and one thing that's sort of um, just having is how many people here are committers on Apache projects of one form or another? Okay, a reasonable number. 
And I take it the rest of you are, are users of one or more Apache products. Okay. Um, from a, from a committer point of view, one of the things that you can do that will really make your life easier is streamline your release and build process. The easier it is to do a release, the easier it will be to deal with any zero days if you ever have to. Um, and as I say, from you know, Tomcat's experience, they, they do happen. They're not deliberate, but they do happen. Um, and one of, the, you know, one of the things that really helps us is it takes us about five minutes to build a release. Um, it takes a little bit longer to upload it to the servers, but that's yeah. We'll, we'll spend far more time worrying about having the release vote and getting the votes we need. And to be honest, if it's a serious issue, we could get a release out in an hour if we had to. But a lot of that stems from being able to have a really slick release process. Um, so it literally, it's and release, job done. Um, and that that really helps because if you you do not want to have to be fighting your build process while you're trying to deal deal with a. Uh, yeah, a security problem. Yeah, question at the back. So that's reminding me, so that brings up one policy question that I, that I, I worried about recently without it actually coming up in practical terms. Some projects have some very old real estate. I'm thinking particularly about Maven 1. Uh, and a security bug would certainly be the most acute example of something that comes up where we might say, gosh, there's no more institutional footprint here. None of us know crap about this. Can you shed any light about your foundation policy or the security team's approach to how, under what circumstances can we like abandon ship on something eight years old and that no one read? Um, when, for, short answer is whenever you like. Um, and again, I'll come from the, the Tomcat perspective. Um, we have, you know, going back in the Tomcat history, there's Tomcat 7, current release, Tomcat 6, Tomcat 5.5, Tomcat 5, Tomcat 4.1, Tomcat 4, Tomcat 3.3, 3.2, 3.1, and 3.0. Um, we abandoned Tomcat 3 before I even joined the project. Um, Tomcat 4.0, I think, had gone as well. I think when I joined, we were just working on Tomcat 4.1. And currently, we'll keep um, two or three releases supported, and the others we, we effectively de-support. And what we do is we just send an announcement out to the users list and the announce list and the dev list and the Apache wide list saying, right, as of X date, we will no longer be providing updates patches, security releases for this version. And we normally give people 12 months notice. So back in sort of July, August 2011, we said, as of September 30th, 2012, we will not be supporting Apache 5.5. If there is a security vulnerability reported, we will not check 5.5 to see if it is affected. We will not produce a patch. We will not do a release. You need to upgrade. You've got 12 months. So for software like that, it, I think it is of service to your users to make that policy explicitly clear which versions are supported, which ones won't. And Tomcat actually goes a little bit further and roughly says that release will get new features, bug fixes, security fixes. That one will get bug fixes and security fixes. That one will just get security fixes. And we, we bend those rules a little bit. We normally do a little bit more than we said we would. Um, but by having that policy clearly stated, your users know what to expect. And you can quite happily say when a security vulnerability comes in, no, not, not, doesn't affect any supported software. Um, you need to upgrade. Sorry. Well, let me elaborate on that for just a moment. Um, uh, the, the, the other example would be that with the <coughs> web server, obviously, uh, uh, versions 1.2 and 1.1 are, are long abandoned, even before the foundation was formed into official body. Um, but recently, I mean, within the past several years, we've looked at and faced the issue of 1.3. It's everywhere. It was widely deployed. There were a lot of people who didn't jump to 2.0 because it was such a different piece of software. Um, and it, it is a community. It's, it has to be a decision by consensus of your project. As long as there was a core group of people at HTTPD who were willing to maintain 1.3 and check it for bug and check it for security defects and write the occasional uh, bug fix patch, um, we didn't abandon it. And it, it took it, we literally had to wait until that group of individuals had either left or moved on or were no longer had free cycles to participate that we brought it back up for a vote again and said, now is the time to consider that we. Uh, make uh, one three his uh, history, uh, and similarly, what Mark was describing in Tomcat uh, Apache, the uh, web server, uh, we did. We gave him a year's notice, and we said, within you know a year from now, 
we will cease to do anything about publishing vulnerabilities, publishing releases, or whatnot. Um, and at this point, I believe you finally, I mean, we waited for that year to elapse, and then finally removed HTTPD-1.3 tarballs from the disk site. So there are, they are no longer there. Um, but you can find them all. You can find every one of our releases at archive.apache.org. I see. So, you're, so a good thing to do is to couple the lack of security support with the lack of availability on the, on the main disk site. It's like, we're going to distribute it. We should be willing to accept the security bug on it. Yeah, well, that, then, then, then you get into sort of, um, sort of moving slightly away from sort of security policy into yes. sort of distribution and infrastructure policy. Um, but if the, what you should have on disk is sort of your, your, ma your, your latest release of every supported version. So if you have several versions that you're supporting in parallel, then that needs to be on disk. And if it's on disk and it's supported, then the, the security team is going to expect you to produce patches for it. Um, if you don't, then um, well, ultimately we can't make you do anything, but we're sort of going to start raising some concerns and saying, look, you really either need to stop supporting that or support it properly. We don't really mind which one you do, but you, you really need to pick one um, and sort of you know, encourage the project to sort of do the right thing. But it comes back to doing the right thing for your users. You, you know, your users need to be aware of, of what they're working with. So if you're putting something up there on your website that's downloadable, then the expectation from the users is that it's going to be supported in some form. Now, whether it's, yes, if there's a problem, we'll give you a patch, or well, if there's a problem, you'll have to upgrade to the next version, or we'll give you a workaround, but it needs to be supported in some form. Okay. So I have an unrelated question. Does anyone else want to turn first? <laughs> Mm -hmm. as an example of my internal presentation of why we do this, because it has FAQ in there. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just copied the one we did for four one. Policy, so we know what the hell's going on. Yeah. All right. So my unrelated question is, one nice thing about HTTPD is that people run it, right? And so it's clear who the users are, and it's clear what the definition of a vulnerability is in the sense that it's something that can actually happen to a running instance. I've been on a couple of project mailing lists that make library components where we've gotten an email message from somebody saying, well, we've ran the following WSI vulnerability analysis tool in your code. And it says that this line of code here is a security vulnerability. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to open a CVE? And I just thought this was a great opportunity to ask for some larger context on this discussion process from you guys. Um, yeah, yeah we, we've had that a few times on, on Tomcat. Um, and we, the, I'm not a particularly big fan of any form of static analysis for security vulnerabilities. We've had a number of commercial companies um, approach us privately and say, oh, we'd, yeah, we've, we've got this static analysis tool, we'd love to run Tomcat on it, or we've run Tomcat on it, and we'd love you to look at the results. Um, and I've wasted a, you know, a, a reasonable proportion of my life looking at those results. Um, and they're, they're not helpful, to be honest. Um, the, the only things that were ever useful out of them were some of these commercial tools pull in other tools, like things like find bugs. And the find bug reports were usually pretty accurate. Um, there's a reasonable number of false positives, but it's a, it's a pretty small percentage. Um, probably, if you look at the Tomcat code base, prior to us fixing all of the find bug issues, there's probably sort of a 3 or 4% false positive rate with find bugs, which, is, yeah, that's manageable. I don't mind fixing... You know, 96, 97 percent of the issues, and just marking the other three as false positives. But for so the the specific analysis tools, Tom, for Tomcat, we we found they were very much written for web applications. So things that are incredibly dangerous and stupid to do in a web application are actually exactly what the container has to do because it knows that the where the code has come from and it's trusted and it's safe and you know, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, so it was just false positives all over the place. Like the, um, you know, it didn't like the CGI servlet because it, you know, calling, calling exec was bad. Well, that's what the CGI servlet has to do, people. Um, so, the, you know, there are, it, was, it was things like that. So I'm not a huge fan of them. Coming on to the second point, which is about there's a vulnerability reported in a library. What do you do? Is it really a vulnerability? Um, it's a difficult one because it depends a lot on the, how the library is used, and it's one of those sort of judgment calls. 
and it's, that's probably the time to sort of ask the security team for a bit of advice. Um, if you've got other projects that use the library within Apache, then notify their private lists as well and say, look, we've had this report, we, we think you use our library, you know, might this affect you? And you're just trying to get a bit more information as to whether it's an issue or not. And then that, is, that is definitely one, one aspect that the security at team can help you with is, is getting the wider exposure. We run into this very often. I mean, with you know, you, you, you can't have a library component error issue with one of the uh, HTTP client or one of the one of the very common base Apache base Apache uh, Java packages without impacting potentially, you know, 20, 30, 40 different projects at the ASF. Um, I'll give you an example though. Uh, one thing when you talk about uh, MITRE, uh, M-I-T-R-E, which is the CVE. Right. numbering and and really their entire purpose what the reason they came to exist was so that we would have one canonical representation uh, or identification of a vulnerability so where it used to be Securina had their ID and bug track had you know all of these different research groups have their own ID numbers and they still do to this day and, and Red Hat will have this product specific bug number this isn't really helpful. We can't. We don't know if we're talking about the same problem or not. So that's why MITRE exists: is to have a report determine all of the things that fall under that same report, under that same umbrella. You need to actually have an exploit before it's a vulnerability. We were talking about the static code analysis. Yes, there are a bunch of bugs, and they will spit out a bunch of bugs. And some of them are no ops, and some of them, in fact, do bad things. But unless you have a vector through which uh, somebody may maliciously um, cause the program to fail or cause it, in fact, um, one of the more interesting things here, uh, I'm going to read it verbatim, um, but I, no, not all network servers are subject to denial of service attacks. Okay, that's just a fact. You, uh, you can always consume too much resources if you are providing a resource. Um, it's the same as uh, if we were to not raise hands here and just say, who would like to ask questions, just shout them out, and if one person will suddenly have literally all the questions and other people won't get a word in edgewise, that's exactly what a server experiences, right? So we have a very specific definition. We've used it to this day. In general, our philosophy is to avoid any attacks which can cause the server to consume resources in a non-linear relationship to the size of their input. So yes, sure, you, I mean, you're providing a service, therefore you're giving them computational cycles and you know that you can use more, you can use less. Um, this is another example that's slow loris vulnerability. My goodness, I can, I can trickle in byte after byte at your server and I will use up a connection that entire time. Of course, <laughs> and you can do that and that's by design in the case of Facebook or in the case of Twitter, where you have pretty much a persistent stream, yes, you're going to monopolize that one stream. So we don't consider these things vulnerabilities. And we, another example is we have a specific flaw in the APR library that for a very long time we did not salt hashes, which might seem like, and where this becomes an issue is if I'm going to then fill that hash with session tokens or something where if they actually are able to probe memory, they're going to be able to easily <coughs> decipher what this hash is doing or we end up with a hash collision problem where you can actually force this particular hash node to be overloaded and literally waste thousands of cycles, you know, making uh, all, all these duplicate identities. Yes, it could be a vulnerability. Now the question is prove it. And so in the case of APR, we said, Okay, this is a defect. We're going to treat it as a defect, and we're going to go out to the communities who use APR, that we know use the APR library, and do you have, can, can this be exploited? We're all ready to issue a CVE number for this library, but you have to give us a use case of, of, of something that actually goes wrong um, in a malicious way, um, and not simply that causes the program to fail. So these are, these are decisions your project will have to make. Uh, the security team can, can give, give you some guidance, but um, it, it's up to you which, which your uh, project is going to consider a vulnerability and what it simply wants to fix as a defect. Um, yeah, look, just looking at the time, one of the things that we did want to discuss today 
was uh, sort of the, just the, the process for how these vulnerabilities are handled. And that is documented on um, the security pages on the Apache site. There's sort of a, a recommended process that we suggest that projects follow. You don't have to. And there are some aspects of that that you do have to do. Um, and most projects do follow that procedure, give or take. But if you want to do things in a slightly different way, that's fine. But the thing that we did want to sort of just bring up um, is we sort of have a fundamental problem when we're dealing with security vulnerabilities. We, we want to keep the information about the vulnerability private until there's a release available. So when we publish the vulnerability information to our users, we can say, there's this problem, but go and get this release and everything will be fine. Problem we have is that, well, this is open source and we do everything in public. So in order to have a release, there has to be a public commit. There has to be a public tag. There has to be a public vote. And so fundamentally, you've got a vulnerability, you've got a patch that fixes that vulnerability, and you have to commit that patch publicly before you can do the release. And you know, attackers aren't stupid. It's, it's not beyond the realms of possibility to look at a, look at a patch and reverse engineer it and realize, oh, hang on, that's fixing something interesting. That, oh, that looks security. Oh, there's a hole there. I can attack Tomcat or HTTPD that way. So, and obviously, you, you, you don't announce the patch with a big fanfare, say, oh, there's this security patch. Look at this over here, people. Um, you obviously don't you advertise it, but there is this fundamental problem that you need to get the patched in order to do the release, but you want to keep it private. Um, and fundamentally, there isn't really a, a, a perfect solution to that problem. Um, Tomcat has, has sort of used a variety of tactics over the years, depending on what the problem is. Um, if it, we, sometimes we just try and put a fairly innocuous comment, um, you know, clean up or uh, refact refactoring is one of my favorites. Because I, I do quite a bit of that anyway. So if I commit a refactoring patch, it's really not that much of a surprise. Um, so there, there are various ways to try and hide it. And the other thing we'll look at is how close to the release do we actually commit the patch? So. If it's the, the more easily we think it's, go, it's going to be to reverse engineer it, the closer to the release or the tag will commit the patch. And again, the, the more severe we think the issue is, the faster we'll run the release process. So we, we could do, say, commit, tag, roll the release, vote, and release, and get that done within a couple of hours if we really had to. Um, generally, we let the release process run for the normal three days. We've never had anything so serious we need to do the release faster than that. Um, but there, there is that there is that problem, and various projects have got a sort of thought about various schemes of working around that. Um, but what you can't get over is, well, if what you propose because Apache releases source, everything we release is, is it's not, the binaries are a convenience. What we actually release is source, and one of the things that people are going to do is they're going to take that source tarball, and they should compare it against the tag. So if you've decided, oh, well, we won't actually put the commit in the tag until after we've announced the release and we'll sort of fix the tag later kind of thing, then that won't work because the first thing somebody should do when they're voting on the release is check that the, t the source tarball agrees with the tag. If you haven't included one of the commits in the tag, then it won't agree and the release should fail. So that, that, that approach doesn't work. You can try and do the entire thing privately. Um, take, basically, have a copy of your, your SVN repo uh, have a private copy and do everything privately. Um, create the tag, vote on the release, do it all privately, and then publish. Um, the disadvantage with that, of course, is well, we're then not really doing open development. We're doing things behind closed doors. And now, depending on the severity of the issue, there might be a justification for doing that. But that that's really then down to the PMC to make the decision. Look, it, we're prepared to sort of do things more privately than we would usually in order because of the severity of this issue. Um, the other approach that Tomcat's actually taken, we've looked at something and said, oh, we'll publish that now. It's fine. We don't need a release for that. It's, it's trivial to work around or it'll affect one in 10,000 users and even then it's easy for them to work around. So we just publish straight away and say, yeah, there'll be a fix in the next release. That'll be a long in you know, a month or however long um, and just make the, the vulnerability and the work around public straight away. I was going to say, there's, there's actually, and much of what uh, you were alluding to is, is this is all about communications. And so one thing I wanted to point out, and something that we have a, 
we, we find comes up as an issue quite a bit, it's the security team. Um, first of all, you need to communicate as a project, which means you use either a security list, those are all the security lists that exist. Um, if your project doesn't have one, um, infrastructure is happy to create you a new list. Um, uh, if, the, if your project is small enough, if it, you're not, we have 100 people on the HTPD list, we, uh, PMC list. We only have 30, 40 on the APR list, and your project might only have 10 PM people following the PMC list. Then there's probably no reason to have a separate security list. Um, but number one is you need to communicate with each other and test those patches. I mean, write the patch, put it out to the security or the PMC private list, you know, bounce that off of each other and come up with the best patch you can. Immediately thereafter, you do the release, it then becomes a dev issue. Share some background notes with your community. Say, this is how we came upon this patch. Maybe your community, somebody is going to offer, you know that that fixed it. There's actually a better patch that would have been more thorough, and let's come back and revisit this as a community, as an open development community. Second thing, though, there's another communications that gets lost here often, and that's with the reporter. And whoever, was, whoever reported it, whether they were doing it for fame and fortune, whether they were doing it out of the goodness of their heart, or whether they were doing it out of pure malice and spite, they still deserve, they've shared you that information, they deserve the courtesy of a response. They deserve the courtesy of, I, you know, I want to publish my research and I want to do that in three weeks. Will you have a patch ready? Uh, or do you agree that this is a bug? Well, if, that, if you let a week or two weeks go by, what are they going to do at the end of their three weeks? They're like, fine, you guys don't want to talk to me, I'm just going to publish. You know, you, and you can't expect them to behave any other way. Whereas if you talk to them very early and you say, yes, this is a problem and I understand you want to publish, but by the way, these 12 other projects all some way or another indirectly use the same thing. They all want to release before you publish. Can we make it six weeks? Most of them are going to say yes. Almost all the time. I have never, I have never had pushback that said I will not, with one exception. If they are going to present their findings at a research conference or at a security conference, that's a pretty hard deadline. They're not going to cancel their speaking slot just because you didn't get your act together. Yeah, but normally that, that people are quite happy to delay because if, particularly if the vulnerability is affecting more projects, and that actually makes them look better. They haven't found a small vulnerability in one project. They found a larger vulnerability that's affected a larger number of projects, and that gives them sort of more kudos in, in the community <coughs> as a whole. But and from a security team's perspective, we would expect, if we forward a vulnerability report to either a security list or a private list, we would expect within 24 hours, ideally, and certainly no longer than 48, to see a response go back to the reporter saying, thank you very much, we got your report, we're looking into it, um, we'll, we'll get back to you. And I, I've, I've got a sort of a standard text that, that I use for, for Tomcat that, you, that sort of says something along the lines of, um, yeah, please appreciate, this is a project run by volunteers, we, you know, we don't have infinite time, it might take us a little longer than you expect to get back to you, but we will get back to you. Yeah, feel free to ping us if you haven't heard anything in a week or two weeks or or, or whatever it is. And yeah, I've never, never had a problem with that. Um, had some other issues, but I'll be talking about that in the next slot. Um, and just uh, the final communications, because that's really one of the main themes I wanted to cover, is that you do need to communicate with the public. You do need to communicate with your user base. Like we were talking about, you know, what is the support policy? Well, what are the workarounds to this newly discovered defect? Um, how is it going to impact me for, you know, when can you when can you tell us some more? And, and hopefully you communicate those things with your with your users and do so by publishing an advisory. You know, pu publish something that spells out this is what we did. This is what was wrong. This is how you can work around it if you if it's possible. And this is how this is the bug fix. This is what code we actually changed to make uh, to resolve the problem completely. Um, so let me just to give you an idea of the rest of the day. Um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to move on um, to a Tomcat specific. We're going to use Tomcat as the example of here's how one project has interfaced with the security community. Here's what happened behind the scenes at Tomcat. Um, and then at 11.45, we're going to turn this into more of an open roundtable so that if you have some uh, involvement with your project, um, please come on and you know join, uh, bring back the, and share that information with us. And it's going to be just open roundtable dialogue on security and what different projects are doing at the foundation. So thank you all very much. We'll give you all uh, five minutes to take a stretch and uh, uh, rejoin in a few minutes.